I am Nikki. I'm Jason Wynn. Yeah, and we are from the YouTube channel website and all other things associated that are gone with the winds. Ooh, I heard that mic pop. Uh, and so we started sailing about four years ago. Not really sailing, that would be an overstatement. We bought a boat four years ago, and then we learned how to sail it. I know that's a reverse order, but that's just the way we do things. We like to do everything backwards and uh, not efficiently, which is also why we're sailing. If you wanted to go fast, you would just get there another way, right? Uh, so four years of sailing, we don't, we're not experts, we're just novices, but we took off and these are our experiences, I suppose. Yeah. Well, the history behind it is we started in an RV, so we have seven Check. years, there we go, we have seven years of experience uh, living off the grid, living small, and traveling full time. Okay, there we go. Uh, so everything that we recommend, everything that we kind of talk about comes from the experience we had in the RV and both in the, in the sailboat. Um, so I think we should just dive right in. Yeah. These, these are in no particular order. Is that, is that volume okay, guys? Yeah. yeah. Okay. In no particular order, um, the first one let's talk about is power. Uh, lithium and solar. So this is kind of one and two because these are both really big investments. Uh, but our life wouldn't be the same without a lot of battery power um, and a lot of solar power. And lithium makes a lot of what we do possible because it can take a beating way more than the AGMs or the standard batteries that they put on most of these boats or RVs. And it doesn't seem like much when you think about it. I'm just running a laptop. I've got a little UV purification system. We've got maybe a couple fans running. It just seems like nothing. And in, in the house world, the sticks and bricks world, it would be nothing. It would probably cost you a, a few dollars a month to, to run that sort of stuff. But when you're living off the grid with, with no way to get plug-in power, you have to consider every ounce of energy you use. And it's surprisingly, it adds up fast. And that means spending lots of money, unfortunately, on solar and lithium. Yeah, so the way that we think about it is that you're paying your power bill up front when you invest in that technology. Because when you see the price point it can give you a mild heart attack. Um, it, it's, you know, yes. it's a 10, 15, 20, $30,000 investment, depending on the size of the bank that you're wanting to go with, and it seems massive, but you're essentially just paying for all of your electricity for the next 10 years. So if you sat down and you added up what you spend in a year on electricity in your house right now, granted you're not gonna have that kind of power, <laughs> but if you did, you would see that it's a lot of money. So you're just, it's an upfront purchase instead of you know, trickling it out over time. Uh, and power is a big thing. It's your main resource on your vessel. Of course, you can sail by the stars and you can do it with the sextant and you can go that direction. But honestly, if you were that kind of sailor, I do have no idea why you're here listening to us. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> we like to travel with the comforts of home because sailing has gotten very comfortable. It has not always been that way. Old school, those people are legit. Legit. Yeah. We're, we're phonies compared to them, that's Absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. I feel like a fraud every time I stand next to a real sailor. <laughs> They're in like, uh, but so power, we rely on power a lot. So it is at the heart of everything we do. It is our navigation, it's our systems, it's our autopilot. It's I mean, our every, wenches, it's everything, everything, refrigeration. Yeah, it's tied to everything. So for us, Power is number one. Yeah. So making sure that we're set up with really a really good power system. So that is, of course, starts with the heart, where the power comes from. Yeah, the that batteries. Would be the batteries. Yeah. And then from there, you need an inverter. So having a good quality, solid inverter with good customer support. Most of the products we recommend we've had issues with, which is great because then we get to go through the customer service process. Or if we have something we don't know, we get to call the company up and say, hey, this is Jason. They don't, they don't know who I am. I'm having this issue, and the companies that take the time to walk you through your issues, like those are the companies that we buy, those are the companies we recommend, and those are the companies we work with. And that, we feel like, makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, so when you're looking at buying an inverter or buying um, a battery bank, but specifically like an inverter, you know, your charge controllers, all that kind of stuff, one thing you want to ask is, when I have a problem, are you going to send me to a dealer or are you going to help me walk through the problem? There are some companies that do not offer tech support. That blows my mind. Blows my mind. 
You're a sailor, you're gonna be out in the middle of an ocean. They're gonna say, take it to the nearest dealer. You're like, great, in a week? Like, in a month? I need it now. Never? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm headed to a small island. There is no dealer there. Yeah, so make sure that they offer service in the products that you're, you're, you're gonna purchase. Yeah, and one thing we've learned is uh, international warranty. So ask about the warranty. If What happens if your inverter breaks in Panama? What if your battery, what if there is a bad cell? It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Yeah, so ask about their warranty if you're considering buying those upgrades. But one, but I definitely don't want to tell you, go out, buy a boat, and then immediately upgrade the power system. Maybe throw on some solar panels first and use the AGMs that are in that boat until you decide you need more. Unless, unless you're going to buy the boat here and you're going to sail across the ocean immediately. Buy everything here. Everything. Everything. That was, a, that was a piece of information we didn't get right uh, when we bought our boat. We thought, save a little money here, save a little money there, and it ended up coming back to bite us. Anybody see our chain video? Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, um, buying anything once you leave a mainland is really hard. So, of course, you know, maybe once you get to New Zealand, um, if you're over in Europe, you're going to be able to get your hands on things. But if you're headed off to the islands, to the Caribbean, to the South Pacific, supplies get really hard to come by. So also that's where your shakedown trip comes in handy, right? Uh, don't take off immediately. Give yourself some time to figure out what you really need on your boat. Um, we did that to an extent, but we really did think that, oh, we're gonna be able to get it in Panama, we'll be able to get it in Ecuador, and you can for a price. Yeah. Um, and you run the risk of not getting the exact brand or the quality that you really wanted. Yeah, which is nice of buying a boat here in, in Florida. You can, oh, I guess anywhere on the East Coast, really. You can sail down, go over to the Bahamas. You're in a totally different world. You're totally reliant on yourselves, and you don't have support from marinas unless you're just staying in, staying in Nassau for some reason. I don't know why you would. But, I mean, some people maybe want to do that. But you can get out there, live on the hook, test everything, and then it's a quick run back here. You swing by the Costco, you stock up, and you get everything fixed. Okay. Yeah, so that's uh, so batteries, that's kind of why we put that at the heart of the system, but obviously tied directly to that is your inverter and all the other things that transform that power so that you can plug into it. Um, and then solar power so that you can recharge those batteries. Solar has been the most efficient way that we have found to recharge those batteries. There are some, um, there's some amazing technology coming out with alternators, so it's insane how fast they can now charge a battery bank. Um, so it, it's a great supplement to that. Um, it's certainly something we would consider would be upgrading our alternator so that if we do have to crank on the generator or crank on those engines, then it's going to charge it up within an hour, maybe two at the most, and you're ready to go again for another week. If you have questions about that, don't ask us. Talk yeah. to Raf over here. Raf, yeah, he'll tell you um, some of the issues they've been having with some of the systems they've installed, and it's not his fault, um, but he can give you the honest truth about certain products if you're considering them. Uh, I think that pretty much sum, sums up power and solar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, one thing is somebody asked me the other day at the show about putting in residential panels on their boat. And you can. People do it. And that's fine. But I don't say I recommend it because a residential panel is not made to be mobile. So when you have a problem and you're somewhere crazy, they're not going to most likely not going to replace your panel because it's not installed to their specifications or it's not in, and used in a way that they approve for warranty. So make sure you look for a 12 volt system. Make sure you look for something like our Go Power system. Um, there's other panels out there. Uh, so that's just, just that one little warning. Yeah. Uh, the next one, which we kind of already briefly talked about, which is um, your anchor and your anchor chain because they kind of are, they are connected. So to us, they're one in the same. Uh, Wow, we had such a crappy <laughs> anchor in the beginning. Um, it was the anchor that came on the boat, and the guy who had the boat, he didn't live on anchor very often. He was mostly at the marina, mostly at the dock, so it really wasn't as big of a deal to him, so I completely understand. But our first nights out at anchor, there were times where if there was a squall, we had to sleep in shifts because we had to stay up because we would drag, and it just that hook would not set. And it's incredibly stressful. It takes all the fun out of it. I, and I do mean all the fun because you feel like you cannot go to sleep because you're either going to die or end up on the rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it felt at least the first couple of times. So we wanted a new anchor like the moment we got back. 
Yeah, that was definitely a big investment for us is the, is the Mantis Anchor that we bought. And I can tell you firsthand, watching it in Tahiti, we are in weeks, two, three weeks of these constant blows that were coming from all directions, 30, 40, 50, 60 knots. Currents coming from opposite directions of the wind. So our boat was doing crazy stuff. And one time I jumped in just to check, how's, that, how's my anchor set? And here's my anchor. It's out of the sand, flipped up on its side. And I'm, holy crap, I run up, grab my underwater camera, I start taking some photos, taking some photos, thinking, I'm gonna email Mantis and you know, tell them, what's going on? What did you guys design here? Well, turns out, two seconds later, a little bit of wind whips around, that anchor turns, boom, digs right in. Then I inspect further where it was, there's this pile of sand built up around the anchor, and it's just from it setting, flipping, setting, flipping, setting, and that thing maybe moved two or three inches over the process of two weeks of nonstop blows and current. So that is incredible. I will sing their praises. They are not paying me. Unfortunately, I don't even think they give anybody a discount code and we don't like. <laughs> no, but it, and it's not just Mantis. It's we had a really old style, old technology um, anchor. And we see a lot of sailors out there who didn't upgrade, aren't willing to spend the money. It just seems like, well, but I've got one. Well, you I do, but it doesn't by. work. Yeah, exactly. You watch people drag all the time in anchorages. You, you don't have to be that way. You can make sure that your boat's going to be there when you get back. We leave in 35 knots of wind and we put our, our valley gear on and we head to shore to get off of the rocking boat. Meanwhile, everybody else feels like they can't leave. And we go into town, we go have lunch, we walk around, go enjoy the air conditioning at the grocery store. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> and, and we feel like we can do that knowing that our boat's gonna be there when we get back and we don't have to worry about it. But it can be any new style anchor. Mantis is great, but there are lots of other great brands out there. I know lots of people with a Rockna. Um, we can't, I mean, we don't have that, but I've got other friends who do. Their boats also don't move. So I think it's just the newer technology. It's just so much better. So if you buy an older boat, you got an older anchor, get rid of that stinking thing. Okay. So that puts us on to chain. And as you guys know, we purchased, well, Kent actually upgraded our chain. When we were here, there was another boat that just like upgraded their chain, but their chain looked way better than ours. So we put their chain on our boat to save a, a couple thousand dollars, which is a lot of money when you're outfitting everything. So he got us by for another year. But what we didn't expect was we, our chain started jumping, jumping, jumping. It wasn't, it wasn't coming up right, and that's because the chain was getting older. We're putting out way more chains, so it's heavier. Um, so the link size was getting smaller. All that weight on there was causing our chain to jump, and we were, we were really struggling to get our chain up with the, with the windlass. Um, so we thought, okay, we're in Panama, we're in this free trade zone that Panama has, and they have yacht service companies and outfitting companies, and massive yachts go through the Panama Canal. So we went to the most reputable place, and they sold us chain from Miami, a company in Miami. This took a lot of digging to get this answer from them, by the way. This was months of back and forth, and not threats, but just telling them, I'm going to just tell them it's your fault, you know? Well, it turns out it's a company in Miami that sold this chain. We go to their website. They have the chain that we asked for on their website, but they also have a, a, cheaper, version. a cheaper version. And what we ended up getting, even though we requested the higher end version, we got the cheaper version. And for us, we go to pick it up. We sent a very specific email with a very direct link, and we, you know, Jason asked multiple times. So I am getting listed the name, listed the brand, list I'm everything, like down to the serial number, whatever the model number, whatever the heck it was, off of uh, West Marine's website, you know, saying, this is what we want. Is this what you're selling us? Yes, sir, it is. And you're like, okay. We checked again whenever we got there. We looked for that little, like, G4 stamp on the chain. There it was. And we thought, well, I mean, that's the only way you're supposed to know, right? Well, turns out, no. Um, the, first, the first telltale was we're unloading it from the truck at the dock, and a guy walks by. He goes, oh, wow, that chain's pretty. It looks different than my G4. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time it got in my head, uh-oh. And then six months later, all the galvanization had worn off, and we were sold cheaply galvanized chain. And we just spoke to the guys at Lofranz, Tigre, they make the Tigra or whatever the heck they it's called. They make our windless. They make our yeah. windless. And we asked them, like, have you guys heard about this? They're like, yeah, it happens all the time. You should be looking for a chain that says G4 stamped, high test, cold dip, hot, hot dip galvanized, and it should have a certain ISO certification. But really, what he said, that gets too complicated. It's hard to find out all that information. He said, just buy Echo chain. 
Yeah, and, and that is what we ended up with. But um, and it said, you know, matte. He said it's going to be a matte gray. Well, when we picked ours up, it was shiny, and that was why people said it looked different. And when we told him it looked shiny, he was like, oh, he's like, yeah, that's not good galvanization. So it's really hard, right? Like there's only there's these little telltale signs, but to the novice person who isn't a chain expert, and hello, that's not most of us in this room, <laughs> certainly not myself, how are you supposed to know? And so the only thing to know is to go with a reputable company. And so all we know is what we've heard from all of our friends who have bought this one chain, and that seems to be what West Marine sells and what everybody sells, which is like ACO or ACO, and it's by Peerless. And so it has a good reputation. Our friends have it on their boat, so that's what we ended up buying. So it's just more of a, a cautionary tale, and it's just one more thing you have to deal with. So our, our experience has just saved you $2,000, and we'll be accepting donations after the talk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so an anchor and a chain, those it is a really solid setup, wouldn't sail around the world without Easier it. Easier than heck to get it in the States, difficult as heck to get it anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the next one is the water maker. <laughs> now, I've battled with the water maker a couple times, the high pressure pump, a couple times the low pressure pump. It's been a nonstop thing, and most sailors that we talk to say, yeah, water makers are a pain in the butt but that's what allows us to live completely off the grid, never go back to shore for months at a time until something breaks. <laughs> Turning seawater into fresh drinking water is just really amazing. You know, it's an unlimited supply as long as your water maker works. <laughs> But being able to do that, there are a lot of places where water can be a little sketchy. It can get hard to, to get a hold of. A lot of places, whenever you're sailing to the remote islands, there is no dock. You can't go alongside. So then you're toting jugs back and forth, and you watch people do that over and over and over, or you do it yourself. You schlep enough of those, and then you're going to want a water maker too. So fine when you're stateside or you're somewhere with a lot of services. The moment you get away from civilization, so, yeah. I suppose, um, infrastructure, then you're going to want a water maker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, powerful dinghy. That's all you, honey. <laughs> powerful dinghy. Okay, so contrary to what Keith said earlier, <laughs> just because you have a tiller and you have to sit like this doesn't mean you don't have a powerful dinghy. So ours is the perfect size for our boat. It fits the two of us. It fits scuba gear. It fits all of our snorkel stuff, our cameras, everything. It's lightweight. There's no battery, there's no electricity needed, there's nothing else to corrode. When you get to an island like, say, the Marquesas, you're tying up on these walls where the surge is terrible, and then these fishermen come in and they tie up on wall, and the same wall, so now they're bashing their fiberglass or wooden boats into your dinghy, into your engine. Their lines are running in and out of your dinghy. And I've seen center consoles literally get lifted out of the water from a line snapping hard. And it's just, I've saved a couple dinghies as, as well, like because of that exact reason. So I say if you're going to get a dinghy, and a lot of people, I mean, you're, of course you're going to get a dinghy. Get one with a, a big enough engine. Whatever the manufacturer says is the maximum, get the maximum. Sometimes you can even convince them to allow you to put on one just a little bit bigger, which we did. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's held up really well, and I wouldn't change it for the world. We can go miles and miles and not worry. And also engine. If you're going to get an engine, make sure it's a reputable brand. We started with Tahatsu, and it's fine. And then we moved to Yamaha, and I'll just leave it at that. Like, we're very happy with our four-stroke engine. We would, not, we would not go to the Bahamas and buy a two-stroke. Cleaning carbs with dirty fuel. It's a pain in the butt. We see other cruisers do it all the time. Our four-stroke four starts pretty much first time every time. Uh, we've had to do an, uh, an oil change. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. That's all we have to do as far as maintenance goes. And that's, you know, you, you just don't, we already spend enough time working on projects and fixing things. Like, we try to add as little to that list as humanly possible. So a good quality engine, and there are multiple manufacturers that make good, reliable engines. Uh, but the four-stroke, and especially the new technology, works. It's lighter weight, like the two-stroke, and more efficient. So it, it, they're, they're good buys now. Yeah, and, de and definitely, like, we love our dinghy. It's, it's, it's the perfect car. It's like equivalent to a car in, on land. Like, that gets us everywhere, and it's, 
a lot of a lot of cruisers like when we we were buying they said well you should buy like a two horsepower because it's really fuel efficient or a five horsepower because it's really fuel efficient and it's lightweight and you can take it off but if you're buying a catamaran or any sailboat with a davit system that can get it up if it can hold the weight go as big as you possibly can it's just you spend so much time that's that's how you get around once you're there the boat gets you there but then your dinghy gets you around once you are there so you know do you want a bicycle um that you have to work really hard at. And some people, the answer is yes, they love rowing. And, and so granted, it's all about you and what works best for you, know what you want out of it. But uh, for us, it's absolutely a good, powerful thingy that we can spend, we can go miles and miles. We've gone 16, 18 miles in a day on our dinghy. Yeah. And for the whale video, how many people saw the whale video? Yeah, so yeah. thank you're you. You're not doing that with a five horsepower no. engine. No. No, and you're not going out into the, to the middle of the ocean four, five, six miles offshore without a reliable engine. And without a reliable dinghy. The shape of your dinghy, the brand of your dinghy, that makes a lot of difference too. Other dinghies, you get out there, you get out there in the waves, they will flip. It can get very scary. They're not stable, so good quality dinghy. There you go. That's a lot about my dinghy. That's a lot about my dinghy. <laughs> oh. That's, a, that's not a joke to British people. I don't know what's going on. I think it's pretty funny. <laughs> so I get, Only so. Americans ever laugh when we say that. Uh, okay, so this next one, I'm actually curious. Is there Raf or Kent or anybody like from service? Maybe even some of you in the audience will know. But So the Wi-Fi connected helm. That has actually been a really big thing for us because a lot of people have come up to us and asked because when you're looking at buying a new boat, congratulations if that's you. Um, or outfitting a used boat. Or, yeah, but they'll ask about those interior helm stations, and should I spend the extra money to get that interior helm station? Should I, should I do that, that secondary spot? And we usually say, no, save that money. Why buy a whole second setup? That stuff is freaking expensive. Sorry to all the service guys <laughs> out there. Um, but it, it's a lot of investment when a lot of the technology now is Wi-Fi enabled. You can use a, an iPad or a, a tablet, a phone, and it will mirror your helm right there. That is your secondary helm. That's really fantastic. It's, it's just so much more affordable, and we can take that anywhere in the boat. Sometimes when we go sit up front, we take that with us. We need to adjust a degree or two. We don't have to go back to the helm to do it. We just keep chilling, keep hanging. So that has been oddly fantastic and it was something that we didn't even think about whenever we installed it we didn't even know how we would use that and it's been like one of our favorite features yeah definitely and then you can have a third backup because everybody has a phone so you can connect two or three different devices to that and well like even our watches we can connect to our helm and we can control our boat so we can go autopilot we can adjust the course it, you can see how fast you're going. Like having these little devices like a phone or a watch that's smart and connected to your helm, I think is way more powerful than investing in another chart plotter or another whole nav station. Yeah, everything's done by app these days anyway. So you've got iNavix, you've got Gar like Active Captain, the Garmin charts, or whatever charts are your favorite. Most likely there's an app for it. It works really well. So you've just got multiple devices with those charts now, and now they're Wi-Fi enabled. They directly connect your helm, you can put your roots in there. I mean, it's just, it's, it's wild. And I think most of probably the newer manufacturers are all doing the Wi-Fi enabled, but if, just double check for that feature if you are purchasing, because it is pretty handy. And if you're thinking about that second helm station, now you know how we feel about that. <laughs> okay, the next one. This is like, so now we actually are gonna get into safety. And if you've probably trolled our comment section, you've seen a lot of safety concerns. We get yelled at a lot for not wearing a life vest. If you're one of those people, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but what we like to tell people is, if you see us wearing a life jacket, then you should be worried about us. Because if it's, if it's bad out there, we're putting those life jackets on, we're tethered in, and we're going. That's when it's scary. When it's calm, and we're within sight of land especially, we're not going to wear the life jacket. We're, we're going to be comfortable. So you It's know. not that they're uncomfortable. It's just that I understand, and if you're a monohull sailor, that's a very different story. It's drastically different. I, I want to be with that, that life vest on the entire time. That I mean, I've been on, out a couple of times, and I haven't worn one. But for the most part, once you start healing, things are a little bit sketchier when you're walking up on deck. Catamaran just sails differently. It feels different. You feel safer. Um, 
to revert back to when Ruby Rose was on board with us, Nick and Teresa, for anybody that doesn't know them, they're sailing out Ruby Rose. Anyway, they came to visit and they're very good. They always have them on, but because they feel like they need them. They came on our boat, they didn't wear them once. They never even, like, didn't even reach for them. Yeah. You know, so it just, it is a different beast. So if we are wearing them, it's because we think we need them. And that's when things are, are when we're not wearing them, you shouldn't be concerned. <laughs> so, and, and then, so that leads us to buying a life jacket. And the first year we didn't really pay for a nice one. I don't know. No, we had really crappy ones. The yeah. ones that actually have the full foam on them. Yeah. You know, you look like a five-year-old with like floaties on. Yeah, and we attached like a little $5 whistle and a little light. So like we're walking around with our big blue, <laughs> you know, PFDs basically. We and had many people like it, it leave comments offering to buy us proper life vests <laughs> after that because we were embarrassing them by wearing them. So then we got back uh, to re -final, like, finally outfit our boat for the last time before heading off to Panama. We paid for the Spinlock offshore ones. And it's like Deck Plus or something like yeah. that, but there's, there's a reason for that. Yeah, unfortunately, they, don't have, they didn't have an Amazon link, so we never got any credit for selling any of them. No, but. <laughs> unfortunately not. So you can send them an yeah, email them an and email. let them know. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, uh, getting, getting a good, comfortable one that can sit on your, on your neck, around your neck comfortably, and you don't have to worry. Having good tether points where you can clip in or if you fall overboard, a place to pull somebody up. Like That's really important. Little lights that go in there, uh, overboard, man overboard, they call them AIS, MOBs. Like we have all that stuff on there, whistles, um, flashers. Like every single one of those things, those are, are money, let yeah. me tell you, because if you were to ever go over, it sends off an alarm and it brings up on the helm station. So if I was down below sleeping and for some reason he actually did go over and he was wearing that and he's got that MOB AIS on, it's gonna pop up and it's gonna say uh, root it says like man overboard. Do you want to turn around or something do you, do you like wanna, that? Do you want to? Do you want to like? <laughs> and that oh, no. that is that is a decision moment right there, people. <laughs> At, <laughs> exactly. No, no, no. How good is the life insurance policy? <laughs> See, and this has worked out perfectly for us. Mine isn't all that great. He's not. <laughs> He can't, he can't really afford a new boat if I go overboard. Now, if he goes overboard, so it's very important to maintain your relationships on board. Um, uh, so anyway, yes, we invested heavily in that system once we got back because we see the value in it and I wouldn't sail around the world without it because even though you don't always see us in them when we do have them on, it is a huge safety blanket, let me tell you, knowing that I could potentially find him if he goes over or I get found if I go over is a big deal. Um, and then what was the other? Oh, EPIRB. Oh yeah, and EPIRB is obviously the, when we went to the Bahamas, we didn't think it was that big of a deal. We were like, well, we have the inReach, we have the, the Iridium, you know, people can track us, people know where we are. But the more we started thinking about it, it just seemed silly not to have one because all of the, all of, all of the people that are saved every year with EPIRBs, if you use your EPIRB and they save you, they'll give you another one for free. So that's like, that's what they're saying is, Hey, if you have to use this thing, we know we will save you and we'll give you one for free. And I think I'll, I think it's, you're usually only out for a couple hours or something. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is any story you usually read, people do get rescued within a, a pretty reasonable time frame, you know, 12 to 24 hours. And that's going to seem like an eternity if crap has really hit the fan and you're actually going down. That's going to be pretty traumatic but at least you're gonna get rescued. And so whenever we purchased all those life vests and everything else and we thought, okay, well we can retrieve each other, but what if it's the whole boat? We need somebody to retrieve us. And so I hope I never have to use it and I hope I never know anybody that had to use theirs, but if they do, there it is. So again. Um, yeah, I think it's, yeah. obviously it's an important piece of equipment to have on your boat. Yep. Uh, okay, communication, which is also part of safety, right? And um, we wanted something where we could text or email. And so we went for the Garmin. In reach. In reach, um, which is just texting. <laughs> I saw like a hoorah back there. <laughs> um, and then the Iridium Go, because that allows for email. But that was a big one because of also weather. It works yeah. with predict wind, which is what we use for weather and weather routing. And I cannot tell you the ability to like just hit refresh all the time and see what's coming your way, how it's changing your route. That has been 
I just can't even tell you the value of that because we are not sailors. We have learned all of this. We rely very heavily on our technology. And everybody always asks, what happens if it goes down? I'm like, oh, I got 10 backups for all of that. <laughs> Uh, I, so I don't have a plan B, it's for plan A to work. Um, no, I mean, we'd be all right, but it is huge. It makes, it's a gigantic safety blanket. Well, it's like GPS, you know, it, if you don't have good charts, uh, you can't, it's, it's more difficult to navigate. You have to be a better sailor, say. Um, you have to be a better sailor, or you can be a lazy sailor and have really good charts, and you can have all the wind, like, delivered to you right away, and you just think, okay, well, that looks pretty bad, so I'm going to go this way. It's really not that complicated once you get using it. Mm -hmm. Um, and having the inReach, we have them both. If you were going to buy one for starters, I would probably say if you're not on a budget, then go for the Iridium. And if you're going to buy something that maybe you're on a really, a really tight budget, then the inReach is fine. It does have weather, but it's just not quite as... It's not as robust. It's not as robust. But the big deal with that is communication. You can still send text messages. So when things break, you can text Kent. I'll give you his phone number. It's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thankfully, it seems to be that it doesn't matter what time of the day we send a message. He sees that number come through, and he answers every time. So thank you, Kent. Seriously. Um, every time something has gone wrong, just about, we, um, we send a text message. If we can't find a manual, we text a friend or we email a friend and say, I need you to copy this, just the text only, and then email it back to me. So there has been so many things we've had to fix underway, and we had communications, we're yapping back and forth about that problem. Like, that blows my mind. I just, sailors of the past, I mean, can you imagine if you showed that technology, technology to, like, Magellan today, he would roll over in yeah. his grave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so communications, that's a big one. It's also our business, so we have to be, you know, we have to communicate. So not only is it important for photos. family and friends but we can then upload photos to social media and stuff yeah. so we can share with everybody <laughs> and even even for the normal sailor you can have a tracking a tracking map so you can send it to your friends and they can you know I can't tell you how many since we've been back to the states we've run into friends and they're like it was so cool when you sent me that text message from the middle of the Pacific Ocean it just like made me dream of what you're looking at right now and how amazing it must be yeah, cause it's, it sends like a little GPS coordinate dots they get to see exactly where you are how fast you're going you know it's really kind of cool so for family members back at home who are worrying about you they can check in on you at any given moment and they can stop you all they want and then complain about your route and tell you what you did wrong and we just we just <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just bought this we just got this new thing called the y3i so you'll probably see some reviews on that coming up in the next few months I don't know if that's the model number but it's supposed to be even better tracking than what we currently have so I'm excited to see that in action yeah all right and so the last one before the Q&A is um, is a tablet uh, we all have cell phones we use them a lot but a tablet is amazing like, we have an iPhone, but it doesn't matter, Android, iPhone, or iPad. Uh, it's just, it's the bigger screen, number one, but there's apps for freaking everything. And there's a lot of really great sailing apps out there. Your charts can be on there. It's way less expensive than a chart plotter. Uh, so especially if you're just starting out, you don't want to, like, invest in the huge navigation systems yet. An iPhone or a tablet works great, but a tablet is a bigger screen. They have all the RAM mounts now, you know, to help keep it secure to your to your helm station. Um. Yeah, for us, uh, you'll see in our videos when we show the helm, there's always an iPad sitting right next, mm -hmm. next to us because we're doing, you know, whatever. Probably just watching Weather. videos or playing video games or something. <laughs> I don't know. But, <laughs> but no, it's it's having other charts there, and then to be able to take that chart with me, like when we arrived in that super super narrow pass in Atutaki, Cook Islands. Like, for me to go in the dinghy, the charts were off. I'm following the charts, and here I am going through this thing going, holy crap, there's no way we're going to make it. <laughs> and then turn around, and I see the, there's the, the other, like, cargo ship going in and out of another pass. But then to follow that track that, that he just went through, follow him, I'm recording my track, and now we have a line to bring the boat in. So we're not worried about, well, I mean, we're still worried about running aground there, but yeah. at least we had a track that I was able to record. And some people take it to the next level, and they put their a little transducer on the bottom of their dinghy. So now they're, they're doing... Recording depth. Exactly, recording depth the whole way to find an anchorage or to get through a pass to make sure they can make it. And I think that's genius, but then I would have to recommend a center console. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that, that was the last of it. A tablet is a, it's a huge 
piece of equipment on a sailboat and replaces a lot of other things that used to be terribly expensive. So. Oh, 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 and we got rid of one of our phones, so, so we only have one phone number to share between the two of us. So when she goes to shore, I have the iPad, she has the iPhone or, or Android phone, we have a Google phone too. Um, she can call me on Facebook. Yeah, we use like Messenger, um, and we can message each other back and forth. There's other apps for that as well, but that's just kind of our go-to. But because um, he's logged into his account, I'm logged into mine, and so we can still communicate. We can make phone calls. We can have a conversation. We can text back and forth. So we still have a way of staying in communication, even though we only have one cell phone that we pay. And let me tell you how cool it is walking around with a cell phone this big. <laughs> it's like, yeah, hello, yeah, uh-huh. I can hear you now. <laughs> And we don't even need to fly the American flag and everybody knows where we're from. Yeah. All right, so we can open it up to uh, Q&A. You can ask anything you want to know. This is your opportunity. There you go. So when you first started out, you talked about the uh, moving from the RV, and that's where I actually watched you at first, it's like your dry eye camping and how you did the solar on the RVs and all that, because I was on a boat and I wanted to know more about that. But when you moved the boat, what was the actual thing that caused you to say, I want to go sailing? Because here you, you were sponsored, you had RVs, beautiful places to go. What drove you? Uh, so that was always, it's, so it's the exploration, it's the travel itself. Um, a vessel is just a vessel. It gets us from A to B. We love, you know, the boating lifestyle and everything else. But it's the, the reason we're out there is because we want to see we want to see the world. And for me, I really wanted like an RV is the perfect way to explore North America. That's what I think. It's land yachting. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but a boat is the best way to explore the world. And so we had explored North America. It was time to move abroad. Best way to do that is a boat. And that is really that's where it started. Yeah, people want something inspirational there, and all we say is it's pretty just basic. <laughs> it's just simple. We just wanted to go further. Hi. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that one, that one, if you hold that's that here, it's a yeah, little better. It's a little yeah. hot. Um, you've talked before about the Google Fi service, and it, A, is that something that is still good and y'all still use it? But then how does that tie into all the, the SIM cards or all the memory, or not memory, all the cell service you have to buy in all these different countries. How do the two play well together, if at all? So a lot's changed in the past few months. Uh, Google Fi now officially updated their website, and now they have a, a, a disqualification. If you're offshore or if you're in another country for too long, they can cancel your service at any time. So we, this will be a challenge for us this year. I can tell you in the past, we had T-Mobile. It did the same, sort of the same thing as, as Google Fi. Um, but the speeds were so slow. So when we upgraded to Google Fi, it was incredible. I mean, there's nothing like rolling into a new country on a sailboat and start picking up the, the Wi-Fi or the, the, cell, the cell signal and you, your phone starts lighting up and you're like, oh, I can communicate with people again. It's been 20 days. It's just an incredible feeling. But Google Fi, I, it's, not, it's against their policy now. So I can't say that I would recommend you to purchase it um, at this point. And, and unfortunately, I couldn't tell you what to purchase. There aren't a lot of international cell phone plans out there. I mean, there are, but they're really freaking expensive, right? And you still need to maintain a number back home. The cool thing with Google Fi is the fact that you can um, start and stop as much as you want, right? So all you need is the, is the SIM card. You can also put it on hold for a while. So the way that we work this, they also are going to punish people that abuse the system, that are using a lot of data in a foreign country, especially for an extended amount of time. So one way we try not to get flagged by their system, and this is all <laughs> probably should not be published on the internet. Uh, we might get our account canceled immediately. But uh, so the way that we work around that is we do buy the local SIM cards because most likely it's still potentially going to be the cheapest data you can get is if there's a local plan. But this gets us by on all those in-between times. It also allows us to keep our US phone number which is really nice. And then we get two phone numbers, essentially. And we just swap the SIM card in and out. Or we also have an old phone. And that's usually the one we use as our local phone number and with the local SIM card. Uh, so we get to keep our phone. We can still text. Um, those are unlimited. That's really nice for family members back home, the people who refuse to use WhatsApp. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we use that, and that way it, we don't use as much data on their system, and we haven't gotten flagged doesn't mean that we can't. Um, another thing is, is we've heard this from other friends who have 
been sending us this information as well. I actually think it was one of our patrons, so thank you very much, who said they're on a Google Fi and what they're doing is they're keeping, because you can get more than one SIM card, it doesn't cost you any extra money, it uses exactly the same plan. So they've got a family member at home using that here in the US and then they've got theirs wherever they are. So then what's happening is you're getting pinged in both locations. So it's still being used in the US and that's kind of part of the deal. So that's a little bit of a workaround. I'm sure they don't want us shouting that from the, the rooftops and how long that will last, I don't know. I mean, the problem is, is every year they keep working to make it a little bit more difficult for all of us. But we are traveling international, we are constantly moving and I think that helps um, that we're not sitting in one spot or one country trying to use this religiously as our main cell phone. It, we really are just using it as supplemental to get us in and out and to make sure that we can still use our U.S. phone number to make U.S. phone calls kind of thing. You, you talk about solar power and power being on the boat being the most important single thing you have. Now that you've been on your boat for a while and you've, you've been able to use it for years now, do you find the solar power you have that you installed when you left here for Panama adequate or would you have changed that, added more? Um, I've followed you, I've looked at the generators being, uh, new alternators, you know, coming through, but what have you found, is it enough? Because like, you always can use more power, but now that you're on there, do you really have enough or would you wish for more? Well, I'll let Jason take this one, but before I do, I'll just go ahead and say that Raphael's gonna like the answer to this one and it's gonna be that there is never enough. Oh, like uh, Tim Allen always says, more power, oh, ho, ho. I don't know if you guys watch that show. It's something like that, I can't remember, but yeah, more power. The more power you have, the, the, the simpler things will be. Uh, the 1,600 watts of solar, for those of you that don't know, that's what we have on board. We have two 40 amp MPPT controllers, and we have uh, 1,200 amp hours of battery, lithium battery, and it's, it is enough for most people, and it would be enough if, I, if we weren't on our computers nonstop. So if we weren't on our computers nonstop, and me editing video uses a lot of power, I don't know if you've seen my machine, but it has like a brick for a, a transformer, and it, it sucks power down. So I would say that would be more than enough for the, for the average user, uh, but if you need to push it, or if you wanna run your AC more than an hour occasionally, then I would say double, so what, yeah, 2,400, you know, amp hours of battery, I would start there, and maybe 2,000 watts of solar. In living with a boat, I take it that there's always the issue with moisture damaging everything. Is there certain items like clothing or food or electronics that you use to help mitigate the salt air destroying everything you own? We probably could do more to save certain things, spray some stuff or whatever, but we find that moisture will always be a problem. You can put a damp rid thing in, but that's gonna go like that. You can use a dehumidification thingy, but it just heats up whatever the heck room it's sitting in and it overflows the little bucket. Unless you're sitting at a dock with the AC running and yeah, you're gonna battle that issue nonstop. And fortunately, our laptops have all lasted, our cameras have lasted, so I don't know if it's Sony makes good cameras or Alienware makes good laptops, but it's, it just, it's just worked and we haven't had any major issues of any of our electronics dying, I don't think. Not entirely, uh, but we also, running an air conditioner does help a lot, even if it is just like a couple of hours a week, um, it, it does, just kind of take some of that moisture, some of that humidity. It circulates air in areas that might not otherwise get circulated. Um, we run fans pretty much nonstop. They don't ever get turned off. Um, circulation is huge. So even though the air is humid, it's still, if you circulate it, you're good to go. Um, I clean like a dog, like all the time. Vinegar, tea tree oil, um, oregano, little mixtures of that. Uh, Baking soda is also really great. Uh, you can sprinkle that in lots of little areas, helps keep mold down. The moisture will always be there. It's more that we're combating mold and then of course rust on anything. And so it, it is a constant battle, but it's wiping down, keeping clean, 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 clean. That's all I can say is you will spend a lot of your time cleaning and wiping down things. But if you do, it pays off. Uh, just a quick heads up. We'll do about 10 more minutes. 
And uh, I will say it's a great thing that uh, you said, Jason, about the lithium batteries, because that's the next thing we'll talk about, so perfect transition. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So stick around for that talk and uh, yeah, drill them with questions. Well, this might be with whatever we're going to discuss. My question was, you transitioned to lithium batteries, correct? In the RV. Oh, but not the boat already had lithium when yeah, you? No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, boy, is that a story. <laughs> Uh, yes, it had lithium, and that's a good point when it comes to choosing quality products. If you buy the cheapest item on the shelf, sometimes you get the cheapest performance. Um, so you get what you pay for, and you certainly get that when it comes to lithium batteries. You want something that is known for quality. It's not a brand new company. You, you want good warranty uh, because sometimes the they might not install their BMS properly, they might, a cell can go bad, whatever the case may be, but um, our first ones, I'll, I'll just let you tell that. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the big benefits of buying this boat in particular is he had four 200 amp hour lithium batteries in there. And I won't mention the brand, I don't know if they're still in business or not, but apparently it was kind of a shady company. And turns out two of my batteries were toast. When we took them out, we popped them open, I was, concerned it wasn't working right. And Raf put the testers on, figured out that, yep, two of them are toast. So that's when we look to rely on. And that's when we upgraded our system. Fortunately, they had uh, 300 amp hours in the same size that had just launched. So we got to test, put in one, two, three, four, four, 400 more amp hours in the exact same space. So that was huge. And uh, we've been happy with them. Um, we had one of, the, one of their batteries go down on our generator. And it was 100% my fault. Um, well, not my fault. It was a, a part failed on the generator, and it was overcharging the battery. And they have built-in protection. But after an entire year of just pushing the battery, pushing the battery, pushing the battery, it finally died. And that was kind of an unfortunate circumstance. But um, we replaced it with a lead-acid battery, and that one died too. So then we go, oh, well, maybe I should look at the generator. So that totally different story. But yeah, lithium batteries, they change everything in the RV. We started with uh, lead acid, and then from there we went to lithium, and it's incredible to fit two times more usable pa uh, power in the same footprint. It's, it just changes everything. <laughs> Getting my steps in today. Thank you. You have so many systems going on and so many things to keep track of. Is there a computerized ga gauge or company that you use to tell you when you should be checking this or checking that so that you don't get behind on maintenance when you're the only one out there doing there, it? There are services like that. And Do you use something like that? Um, our boat's old, um, so it would be a lot of investment to run Ethernet cables through everything, connect to everything. That there's systems like, maybe Raf would be able to tell you better. I've heard of things like Ghost or, um, or Barnacle or like, there's a few different people that make things that, that can monitor everything. Victron makes good stuff that like monitor your batteries and your solar and everything. Yeah, um, yes, so there, there, there are systems out there like that and there, um, I cannot for the life of me think of the name of the app, but I can tell you the name of the sailor and the, the the Instagram handle or their blog to look up, and it's their product that they have designed. They used to work for Microsoft. They developed a program. Um, the boat name is Bella Marina, and uh, we, we, we were out in Tahiti cruising with them. That's where we met them, and they told us about this app, and it is really cool. It does require connectivity every great once in a while to send you those notifications, right? So you do need some sort of internet. That's the way all of that works. But you plug in all of your boat's information one time, your maintenance schedule for everything one time, and then it's gonna send you reminders. And you can hit snooze, so that it's gonna to continue to remind you until you take care of the problem, right? Because a reminder, uh, yeah. Um, so yes, there are, there are those things. And it's not a bad idea, because it is a lot to remember. It's a lot to take on, and as much as you think you're gonna have it under control, you're gonna forget about crap anyway. So it just takes, it's one less thing to think about, um, and it is, for peace of mind, I think it's like 15 bucks is what the app costs, and it does all of that. So it's not a huge investment. Vessel Vanguard, and there's a there's another one. If you if you're buying a new boat, a lot of them send every every item that they install on your boat. They send it to these places like a Vessel Vanguard, and there's a couple others that we've heard of that all your manuals are within this app, 
and reminders are within this app, and based on your generator that's installed in your boat, it's going to remind you every, everything you need to do. So that's pretty incredible for a new boat. Um, the app that they developed is for older boats, so there's a lot of data entry. It's going to take you quite a bit of time to organize all that. But once you have it organized, then yeah, sure, maybe it saves you some time and, yeah. and gives you reminders. Yes, and if anybody would like us to test that um, and would like to buy us a new boat and install that, uh, we're available for sponsorship. Just let us know. It's testing. It's not for sponsorship. Product testing. Product testing. Product testing. Yes. Another question? Raise hands. Everybody good? Good. Thank Great. You guys. Yes. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>